Welcome to Virtual Wednesdays. My name is Francesca D'Alessio, and I'm so glad you could join us. Tonight, we celebrate the pioneering feminist artist, Judy Chicago. As we open her first retrospective at the De Young this Saturday, August 28th. Join us tonight for a conversation between Judy Chicago and the exhibition curator, Claudia Schmuckley. Claudia is our curator in charge of contemporary art and programming. Tonight, we learn more about Judy Chicago's artistic career and the exhibition that includes approximately 130 paintings, prints, drawings, ceramic sculptures, in addition to ephemera, several films, and a documentary. Please join me in a warm welcome to Claudia Schmuckley and the legendary Judy Chicago. Thank you so much for this kind introduction, Fran, and welcome Judy. Here we are on the eve of the opening of our exhibition. As I've been installing the show, I've been reflecting so much about our work together and the past years and all of our conversations, and I'm thrilled to share the outcome with our audiences. Hi, Claudia. Great to see you. It's been incredible working with a curator of your talents and abilities. Well, thank you. Uh, I wanted to revisit the beginnings. When we first talked about this exhibition, we both shared a sentiment that a retrospective of your work was long overdue. However, as we began conceiving it, you clearly grappled with the classic format of a retrospective which shows an artist's evolution from youth to maturity. Um, after many discussions, our solutions to this dilemma was to turn the logic of the retrospective on its head, or actually better to take it literally and open the exhibition with your most recent work, moving back in time. Can you speak to why this change in tactic was so important to you? Actually, I've been joking about it in the interviews I've been doing which goes something like this. Well, you know, uh, one of the questions I've been getting, particularly from people who read The Flowering, my autobiography, before doing the interview, is like, well, why did the art world, like, keep your work out, uh, so much of your work out of view for so long? And so I, of course, had to think about that. And also, Writing the flowering gave me time to reflect on some of the reasons for what Tom descri Campbell described as my marginalization. And I actually realized that there is a lot of subject matter that I've dealt with that makes people very uncomfortable, particularly those people who are invested in the kind of meaningless art that has been promoted by the ever more money-driven art industry. As a result, it's been a struggle first, well, to get the dinner party house, that took 30 years. But by now, you know, people have become familiar with and somewhat comfortable with the dinner party and its imagery. And then as you know, I used to go around saying, I wonder if I'll live long enough to see the body of my work emerge from the shadow of the dinner party. Well, you know, then that started happening with Pacific Standard Time. And so my early work started coming into view. And in the last few years, there's been a lot of interest in the birth project. But that's like, you know, the first three decades of my career. And I think Number one, people don't understand how much art I've made, which I think the retrospective will give a clue about. But then, yeah, Power Play has, was recently shown a couple years ago in New York at, you know, my investigation of the construct of masculinity. And that was seen but not really embraced. After that, the Holocaust Project, and then the end, which deals with death and extinction, and along the way, glass. And I, when I started, I know this is a long answer, but it's a long, it's a long answer to a complicated question. And um, when I got interested in working in glass in 2003 and went to Pilchuck, one of the reasons I got interested in it was that I was in Southern California when John Mason and Peter Volkos brought 
uh, ceramics over from a craft context into the high art world. And I, I could see from, I had seen some glass work that interested me, and I could see that glass had the same potential to be brought over from its decorative origins into high art. And so I wanted to do that since I had always been interested in fringe techniques and have done that with so many other techniques. What I didn't anticipate was a really entrenched art world resistance to glass. As one of my dealers said, I don't do glass. So there's glass, there's my subject matter, and the reason I'm so interested in the way you decided to install the show is that the viewer will have no choice but to confront all the subject matter that makes them uncomfortable. So this is what I've been saying about the probable viewer experience. Oh my God, the end, oh my God, death. Oh my God, I'm gonna to have to think about death and I'm gonna to have to think about what we are doing to other creatures. And then I'm gonna to have to wonder whether glass can be art. And then I'm gonna to have to confront the fact that in many disciplines, the Holocaust is considered the major philosophical dilemma of the 20th century. But do I really have to think about that? And then I'll get, they'll get to the construct of masculinity. Well, we know with queer theory and gender theories and all that, there's been some movement around that because of the Me Too movement. And then the birth project, well, it's nice she celebrated birth. And then the dinner party, I may not have liked the imagery, but it's an established art historical reality and then my early work. Oh my God, breathe a sigh of relief. <laughs> Whereas going the other way, the viewer might not go through the trajectory of my whole career. What I love about that arrangement is that we show you as an artist who is firmly grounded in present and pressing societal issues and concerns, that you are very much alive, you're not dead, even though the first object that visitors will encounter is actually a bronze relief of you on your deathbed, mm -hmm. which could also be a tombstone on your grave if you think about it. Mm -hmm. And the contrast between this object and your real life vivacity and engagement is quite jarring, but also deeply moving, I think, in the context of an artist who is taking stock of her life's work at this moment in time. Um, obviously, you made this work, which is part of the end, um, as you were facing some serious health challenges yourself. But the experience of death is certainly not a new one for you. You have suffered significant losses as a child and young adult, including your uncle, your cousin, your father, and your first husband. Did this omnipresence of death impact your trajectory as an artist in terms of how you find and also define meaning in your art? That's interesting, Claudia. I, I certainly think that, you know, having the time to reflect on my life and career in the flowering I mean, there were a lot of things I, I was able to think about. And one of them w was I realized that grief sort of shaped my life. And the awareness of mortality definitely like acted like a shadow. And, you know, Diane Gellin, the dinner party administrator, she recounts stories about when I was working on the dinner party whenever I had to make a trip, I'd make her promise me that she would make sure the dinner party got finished in case I didn't come back. So the prospect and the realization that life does not go on forever and has certainly shaped some of the urgency with which I worked, some, uh, some of the uh, determination, to say everything I had to say, although I certainly didn't know 
what my path was going to be when I was young. You know, I, because life intervened and possibilities and opportunities and content opened up and I took that path and went wherever it led. You know, I'd have, like when I thought about how there was an absence of birth images in contemporary art and so that took me down a path and I don't know exactly how I'm trying to think about whether or not grief and the knowledge of death and my own mortality I I don't think it influenced my choice of subject matter but I do remember in the Holocaust Project video, <clears throat> I took up the subject, I addressed the question, you know, can anybody, and it's the same question that happened around the birth project, can uh, um, somebody who hasn't gone through the experience actually render the experience with any authenticity? And I talked about, I used to joke, well, Obviously, you don't understand art because you didn't have to be crucified to paint the crucifixion, you know. But I reflected in the Holocaust Project video about empathy. And actually, you know, when you were thinking about using that word in the title, I thought it was very fitting because what I said was, you know, I've experienced loss. By the time the Holocaust Project is finished, I will not have any family. I know what that experience is. Do I have to have been a survivor of the Holocaust in order to enter that territory? Because that was a very big argument at the time in the 80s. Also, at the time, the idea was that nobody who wasn't a survivor or a child of survivors dared address the subject of the Holocaust because it was so incomprehensible and mysterious. And as you know, by the time Donald and I got finished with our eight-year eight journey, we had concluded, tragically, that the Holocaust is all too understandable. And it's been interesting to me to see recent literature and writing on this because I read this article in the New York Times last Sunday, and it was about the people who do the lowest paid work in our societies. For example, working in a slaughterhouse, or I would make the leap to finning sharks, because implicit actually in the treatment of animals and other creatures in the end is a, a questioning of what it does to you to fin sharks or to work in a slaughterhouse. And it's mostly men who do those kind of jobs. So uh, the person writing the article made the analogy to the Germans who, who looked the other way and were complicit and were, with their silence, complicit. Well, I mean, we can look all around. It's like, look at the tragedy of Afghanistan, the lives lost, the money spent, right? Based on a thicket of lies. And when I was researching for the Holocaust, I'll never forget this rabbi saying to me, what you're going to learn is that reality is a tissue of lies. Yeah, and still is, obviously. Not much yes. has changed. Yeah. I did want to ask you about how you relate to the term of an activist artist. And let me frame that question. As different as your major bodies of work may appear on the surface in terms of subject matter, material, and technique, they do all share fundamental qualities. On the one hand, the desire to connect personal with universal experiences mm -hmm. and truths. Um, 
on the other hand, also aesthetic strategies that recur throughout and actually go back even to your minimalist days, including the fusion of image and ground, um, the employ of a rainbow color palette and a highly stylized formal language that blends figuration with abstraction. The recent reception of your work, which as you pointed out earlier, has uh, focused on particular bodies, most of them earlier bodies of work, maybe a little bit segueing into power play, um, has very much focused on the political content of your work and reframed it in terms of uh, you know, cultural theories and ideas that, uh, that have now emerged to be part of you know, a broader discourse. Um, but oftentimes they frame you as an activist artist and they don't really speak much about the aesthetic properties of your work and, and how, you, how you are framing these subject matters. So how do you feel about that characterization? And, and you've touched a little bit on this in your sort of opening remarks, but what does it leave out? And what do you hope that people will take away from this perspective apart from this realization that you know you always have dealt with difficult subject matter as you put it earlier well i think that that's just another art world strategy to try and fit me into a niche i think one of the problems has been all along is i just don't fit in the art world categories I, in fact i would say my whole definition of what it means to be an artist is at odds with the narrow role of the artist that has developed, particularly since the advent of, uni of so, such widespread university art education that has promoted such coded art. I mean, like, you know, what I always say is uh, there might be content in a lot of that work, but it's presented in such a way that you have even an art smart person has no idea what it really is, which makes it very safe. Because if you're buying and selling art like pork bellies, you don't really want meaning or content to get in the way. So I do not consider myself a political artist, in fact, or even an activist artist, because an activist artist implies doing social action as art. Having dinners, for example, or as opposed to making objects. Uh, doing group performances that empower the participants, as opposed to making transformed deeply thought through imagery. Political is a word I've really stayed away from and tried to make my art stay away from because it ties art to a particular period. When actually when we were in San Francisco, I can't remember who I had this conversation with, you know, when we came out there for the meetings last week, I had a conversation with somebody who was telling me Oh, no, it wasn't in San Francisco. It was with Martha Teichner from CBS Sunday Morning, actually, because she had been here, and she, she had done interviews all over the world. And she was telling me that a particular problem for the artists and writers in South Africa was that their work was tied completely to the injustice of apartheid. And when apartheid ended, they found themselves stranded. Well, I never wanted that to happen. I never wanted work that I made to become like so much of its time. And, and actually, this is interesting because when I, when I was starting the birth project, I went to Mexico City, presumably to see the Diego Rivera murals because, you know, he taught, that was one of his goals in the whole Mexican mural movement, was to teach art, through, uh, to teach uh, like political consciousness through art, to use art to educate. And, you know, since when I started the birth project, that subject was so shrouded in mystery and mythology, you know, I thought I could learn something. 
Well, what happened was I didn't know much about Frida Kahlo then because she was not well known in America. And I visited her house. And it changed my entire perspective because I didn't want to teach through art in such a way that it, the art would be limited by the political moment. I only was interested in what you were talking about. Can the female experience be a pathway to the universal in the way that male experience has historically been? Can, uh, can the Holocaust teach us about our world today, not just like, you know, how could the SS officer come home from a hard day at the crematorium and pat his dog and kiss his wife and play with his children? But can it really educate us about the nature of power on the planet? And I don't believe art produces social change. But I believe that art can educate, empower, and inspire people to make social change. But only if that art deals with subjects people care about in ways that they can understand. I mean, that would be something I would share with Diego Rivera, the fact that his work, his imagery is intelligible. But like, for example, driving the world to destruction, okay? When I did Power Play, it was the only work to that point that was ever met by silence. And I realize now that there was not an, there was not a context, not only for people to understand it, but even for me to be able to say something like, that figure is symbolic of how patriarchal values are driving the world to destruction. Okay, well, why is the male figure symbolic? It's not a particular man, right? No, it's a particular set of values that can be upheld by men or women. And we can see now the evidence of that painting. Is that a political statement? Or is that a statement made to try and help people wake up? up. Now, if encouraging people to wake up is activist, fine. But that, that definition I would accept. But that is not the usual definition of activist art. Perfect. That's exactly why I wanted to talk to you about it. And thank you for that clarification. Um, the transcendent part of your work that you touched upon here. It's longevity beyond the political moment. I think it's something that really comes out strong and clear in the retrospective. The one thing also that's not so much talked about, maybe, um, that I feel Jenny Sorkin's essay actually shines a beautiful light on, and I would love for you to talk a little bit about, is the idea of the, the spiritual, if, if we can call it that, uh, that sort of underlies, it seems, a lot of that work. And spiritual not in the sense of an adherence to a particular belief system, um, but in terms of uh, this motivation or transcendence that you just sort of address, transcendence of a particular moment. And I remember you talking about being inspired by image traditions that come out of an ecclesiastical context, a Judeo-Christian context, but also, of course, other spiritual traditions um, outside of the Judeo-Christian framework. What about those traditions do you admire, what are the qualities that you pick up upon? And is it fair to say that 
your work cannot can be read in such terms as well. And the one thing about you, Claudia, is you never you never ask me questions that I can answer with some of my pre-made answers for interviewers. That's the whole idea. They always cause me to think, have to think. I mean, I, I, you know, I, I'm a great admirer of Jenny Sorkin. I've known her since she was a graduate student. And, but I remember reading her essay and being a little bit taken aback by it. I mean, I think maybe she was talking about what you're referencing is transcendental, transcendental. Because the word spiritual, and she used it also, I think she used the word religious. And um, what, are, what are spiritual or religious traditions? They're actually forms of morality. They are a set of moral codes that, for example, in the Middle Ages was taught through art, is taught through the Koran or the Bible or the Talmud. And the one thing they all have in common is patriarchal values in that they posit the male as the accepted head of everything, the family, society. And this is most easily perceived in the lie about birth that's embodied not only in the Bible, but in the Sistine Chapel, that a male god reached out his finger and created man. And that's the origin of the human race. And also, the the right of that man to create dominion over the earth. Well, we see right now what that idea has gotten us to, right? As we watch our planet be destroyed through that very same dominion. So, I, again, this is a long answer. Do I believe in God? Yes, but I certainly don't believe in some white guy up there in heaven. I believe that the miracle of life is God and that the appropriate response to that is awe and respect. And I think that I have brought that to bear on my work. So as prosaically as like why I hated oil paint, because it was imposing paint on the surface of the canvas and how I wanted to fuse color and surface, paint and surface. I did not want to dominate. I mean, I watched those pictures of Jackson Pollock painting, and you know, that's the patriarchal impulse. Dominate that canvas. Imprint one's self on it. That's like the patriarchal, or, or like in, in land art, right? You know, these guys going out and bulldozing up the earth. How many creatures get killed in the process of that? So I have brought, and I guess this goes back, actually it does, I hadn't even thought of it, but it does go back to my early awareness of mortality, right? Mm -hmm. So I have just, and you know, I think it's become clear to me is that the reason I've been marginalized in the art world is that my work represents a completely different set of values about art, about the world, about our relationship to the world, about our relationship to other creatures, you know, and that is why I had to be so isolated so long is because I had a different vision. And now you are going to make that vision apparent through the retrospective. And so, you know, I've been doing these drawings about 
who I am, what I believe, everything on display. I mean, it's kind of overwhelming, actually. It is. I can't wait for you to see it in person, truly. I, I somehow wish you would have been able to do that before we had this conversation, but uh, it'll be interesting to see how about your reaction will be after. I, just, I saw enough of it. Wait, I saw enough of it even before the show was fully installed to realize that you were making clear the scale at which I've worked, not only in terms of physical scale, but intellectual scale. Actually, this is a funny story. There was a wonderful guy named Carl Bells who used to run the Rose Art Gallery where the Holocaust Project was. Mm -hmm. And he was, after the Holocaust Project opened and got these vicious reviews, he had a conversation with me and Donald. He said, you know, I've been thinking about this. You know, he said, I had Frank Stella here and he presented himself as the, uh, in a long tradition going all the way back to the Greeks. And I had somebody else, who's Richard Serra here, who positioned himself as the greatest sculptor of, 20th, of the 20th century or whatever it was. And he said, and I was wondering why everybody got so upset about the fall where you, you know, talk about how the Holocaust grew out of the very fabric of Western civilization and you, you and Donald made connections between the way we, you know, like current activities and the l larger universal issues. And he said, and I got it. Oh, I thought she's a girl. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just talking about kind of being yeah. Amazing, even myself at the scale at which I worked, right? Yeah. So you've, you know, you, you're making that very clear, and I, I, and also the fact that you've included my preparatory materials, and which will show people something about how, how what I've said that people didn't understand the simplicity of my imagery sometimes often belies its complexity, right? So it was pretty overwhelming to me, you know, I remember because you wanted me to come in as soon as we got there and I told you I couldn't because I needed to concentrate on the smoke piece and I said because I have no idea how I'm going to react and whether I'm going to turn into a puddle of tears. Well, I got pretty emotional when I got in there, even, you know, even though the show was only half installed. Because I, I realize what you've done, Claudia. I hope other people realize what you've done. Well, I want them to realize what you've done, really. I mean, that's the whole purpose of this show. Um, to really, to, to give everybody a sense of who you are as an artist and as a person beyond the little that most people know, which is, for many millions, still the dinner party. Right. So, one obviously, more question, Claudia, one more, okay. yeah, one more question. Um, obviously, you are best known as Judy Chicago, the feminist. How has your conception and idea of feminism changed over the last six decades? It's definitely expanded. I mean, when I was young, it focused mostly on uh, the inequality of women. It was actually during the Holocaust Project that I realized that the inequality of women really needed to be seen in a larger st global structure in a system of injustice and oppression that catches most people in its clutch. And that if, if women are serious, if feminists, who don't have to be women because feminism is a system of thought, if feminists are serious of wanting systemic change 
And if, as many people are now starting to realize and write about, the only way to save the planet and life on it is systemic change, then together, as human beings, men and women, we have to figure out how to change direction. Not just for us privileged white people in America, but for the entire planet. And whether we'll be able to do that, I have no idea. Well, the conversation has just begun, Judy. I hope my art will start that conversation, Claudia, or contribute to that conversation. I do too. That's the goal of this retrospective. And I look forward to celebrating with, it, with you tomorrow. And I look forward to welcoming everybody in the museum as of August 28th to come and see Judy Chicago, a retrospective, which will be on view through January. Thank you, Judy, and until very, very soon. I look forward to raising a glass with you. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you so much, Claudia Schmuckley, and of course, Judy Chicago, for sharing your time and your incredible insight with us tonight. Please come see the exhibition opening this Saturday, August 28th, Judy Chicago, A Retrospective. And please check out our website for more information about the exhibition and to book your tickets online in advance tickets.famsf.org. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. We hope to see you next week.